we're really excited about tonight's webinar. Uh, the webinar is about BioWarma. The webinar is sponsored by University of Maryland, myself, Virginia State University, Dr. Dahlia O'Brien, Delaware State University, Dr. Kwame Matthews, and Fort Valley State University, Dr. Nikki Whitley. Uh, we've been doing a, a, quite a few webinars uh, this spring, but this one's probably the, again, I think the most exciting because BioWarma is a new product mm -hmm. to the United States. It's been available for a, about a year. And I know there's a lot of people that are interested in it. So we're gonna have a presentation. After the presentation, there will be opportunities to ask questions. Please type your questions in the chat box. Please try to keep your questions to the topic. Um, please try to wait to the end because you might find that your questions get answered during the presentation. And please do not answer the questions. We would like our presenter to answer those questions. Tonight's webinar will be recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube in case you have to leave, in case you lose your connection, or in case you have a friend who might be interested in watching this presentation. I'm very happy to have Chris Lawler with us. Chris is from International Animal Health Products. It's an Australian company. This is the company that develop, manufactures, and markets BioWarma products. This product has been in development, I believe, for over 20 years. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Chris. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, um, it's 9 a.m. in Australia, so we're in tomorrow and you're in yesterday, um, which always makes it interesting. We have a lovely day here, so hopefully you've got something to look forward to. Um, I'd just like to move into the presentation. So um, a little, just a little bit about myself and the, and the company. We started this process in 1997. Um, it's a world first. Um, we're very excited about it. We have registrations in Australia, New Zealand and the US. Uh, and it's great to be able to present this sort of product firsthand and, and give you the most up-to-date information that we can provide. So we'll get straight into the presentation. So first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about um, just trying to get the page to change. Okay, so what, first of all, what is Duddingtonia flagrans? It's a natural fungus that is found all around the world um, with an application as a biological control uh, for the larvae of parasitic nematodes of grazing animals. So the fungus is, is, uh, is all around the US, Canada, um, every country that you'll find um, Duddingtonia flagrans and there'll simply be variations uh, on the strain that we've chosen. So why do we need it? Well, we need it because of uh, resistance to anthelmintics, which continue to get worse all the time. The need um, to reduce our reliance on chemical controls and the emergence of in integrated parasite uh, programs. So they're things like um, rotating the wormers, um, rotating pasture, cross-grazing of species, um, and uh, uh, you know, just trying to, to, um, to, to improve the way we do things overall. Um, so how do we use it? Well, firstly, we encourage everyone to do a faecal egg count. We really need to know the levels of, of um, eggs that you've got uh, in the manure of your grazing animal. Then based on those results, we treat the animals with an effective uh, chemical wormer. So we're trying to remove the worms from the animal itself. Then if it's possible, and, and look, I know it's not always possible. In fact, in a lot of cases, it isn't possible. Try and move animals onto low worm pasture. Now there's a fair bit of debate about what low worm pasture is, but just generally speaking, it's pasture that hasn't been grazed. We say for a minimum of six weeks, but ideally you'd like um, even three months, a season, for example. Um, and we know that's not always possible. I mean, we have been through the worst drought over the last three or four years um, in a hundred years. So there is no low worm pasture. In fact, there's no grass, but I mean, we've had rain, significant rain in the last few months and that's made an enormous difference. And then we administer the deflagrants uh, <laughs> into daily rations. So how does it work? 
Well, it works by feeding the a supplement containing the fungal spores and they pass through into the manure. Now, one of the things that you need to remember, and we had a number of questions about this, about therapeutic doses, etc. This product has no effect on the animal itself, okay? The chemical that you use to worm the animal does have an effect on the host animal, but we're not, we're not concerned. All we're doing here is we're using the animal as a delivery vehicle. So we're feeding the fungus, passes through into the manure, and that's where it breaks the parasite's life cycle by trapping, paralyzing, and consuming the infected larvae within the animal's manure. And it's equally effective against resistant parasites. Now the fungus itself cannot differentiate between a resistant, non-resistant or multi-resistant parasite. All it's looking for is a food source. Um, so it's a natural organism. It's isolated in Australia by CSIRO. So CSIRO is our single largest government research organisation. Uh, it employs about uh, 5,000 people and they found this in the early 1990s. To give you an idea of CSIRO, they, um, one of the incredible products that they produce is Wi-Fi. So they develop Wi-Fi um, for basically for the world and there's a number of other things that they've done as well. Um, the products would need, need to be safe for animals, people and environment and certainly um, Dudingtonia meets all of those um, things. The uh, products are palatable, easy to use and have good uh, shelf life. There's, I know there's a few uh, people have a few issues with the palatability but we'll, we'll discuss that um, a little later on. This is what the spore actually looks like. This is magnified about 600 times. Um, this is, it creates a trapping network. So it's actually capturing, uh, forming these lassoes. It's, it's actually capturing those nematodes in the manure. Uh, here is a, um, an example here where the, the um, nematode has been captured and this is eight hours post capture and then 48 hours post capture. Um, I've got a short video here. I'm not sure how well it'll work. If it delays, I might just skip it. Just not sure it's going to work. No, we'll give that a miss. Oh, yeah, here Ooh, we go. Dryer woodlands. They have great difficulty in living out in the open. Instead, they hide in the ground or within the tissues of the bodies they feast on. A fungus has no stem, no root. No leaves. For most of the time, it's nothing more than a tangled tissue of branching threads. These produce digestive acids, absorb the resulting soup, and then use it to construct more threads and widen their search for more dead plant tissue. But cellulose is very low in nitrogen. To get that, some fungi trap living animals. The microscopic threads develop tiny lassoes. These give off a chemical that attracts microscopic worms, nematodes. One of them nuzzles into the ring. And the fungus suddenly draws its lasso tight. The worms are killed and the fungus as its match. All this takes place out of sight below ground or within the body of a dead plant. Only when a fungus is ready to reproduce does it make itself more visible. Okay, so that gives you a bit of an idea of how it works. Um, uh, and I think David Attenborough has certainly summed it up very, very well. Um, this is the product that we did all the trial work with. So when we um, were doing trials, we used a product called Livemol, which is a very big selling product in Australia and New Zealand. We sell several hundred tonnes a year. And that um, would translate into, I don't know, um, 600,000 horse doses, cattle doses, uh, three or four million goat uh, or sheep doses, so it's it's a big volume product, but it's an ideal product. It was an ideal product for us to use um, 
in the trial when we're doing the trial work. So we, we put the bioworm into the liver mole when we did it. The reason we chose liver mole is that um, animals receiving uh, adequate feed maintain good condition uh, and good nutrition are better able, able to cope with parasitism and have a positive impact on their resistance and resilience to worms. So that was the reason that we chose the product. So that's why we later on we talk about it. There will be uh, two different, um, if we talk about bioworm and live mole bioworm. Um, I'll just quickly go through some of these trials and I don't want to sort of get bogged down. I just want to explain there's a few things. So the red line is the treatment line. So that's the bioworm line. The control is what's going on in pasture. If you look on the left hand side, cattle trial one as an example, you'll notice the number of cattle infective larvae ranges from between 10,000 and 60,000. The one on the right ranges from uh, 100 to 600. So this just shows you that there's quite a lot of location to location variation. And also there's a difference between um, different seasons as well. So if we look at the other two trials on my left, the autumn location one, you can see um, the number of infective larvae are quite low from weeks two to four, but then they increase quite dramatically by week eight. So you get a lot of variation in pasture, uh, depending on the season. That'll depend on things like sunlight, uh, rainfall, um, daylight length, um, humidity, all those sorts of things. They're all the things that will affect what is going on in, in your pasture, on your property right now. Um, sheep, these are goat trials. Again, you see exactly the same thing. You see, we see enormous variation. So again, on the left, we've got between 2,000 and 120,000. On my right, we've got 100 to 500. In the middle, we've got 5,000 to 30,000. So it's going to depend on where you are, uh, the, the season, um, et cetera. There's a whole lot of var variables that are, that are happening in your environment. Uh, sheep trials were done a little differently um, in that these were done over much longer periods of time. So these were done uh, up to four months. And as you can see, and, and as occurs in all trials, we have a number of different um, worms occurring. So in each of those, we've got four or four or five different worm types. And, and that happens with all. So we get calls from people saying, oh, I've got a pinworm problem in horses. Well, no, you haven't got a pinworm problem in horses. You've got a nematode problem. And one of the things that maybe you're seeing, if they're visual at all, are pinworms. But that is, pro is not the only problem you've got. So these trials were done in such a way that initially we used the sheep and they grazed the pastures. Another group of sheep were kept off pasture and fed in what we call a shearing shed. And I'm not sure if you would understand what that is, but a shearing shed is a shed which is raised off the ground on a slatted floor and those animals were fed so they had no uh, contact with pasture. The first group of animals were then removed and the second group that were on the slatted floors went in and they sort of consumed the pasture and we sacrificed those animals to work out what was left on pasture. So as you can see, um, group, group A, you've got homonchus, which is barber's pole worm. Um, we've got a whole, but we've got a, a massive drop in, in numbers overall in all of those trials. And as I say, we haven't got a lot of time to, to go into them in detail, but they were, they were broken up into groups. So, I mean, one of the things the sheep work was, uh, because they're all what they call, um, good clinical practice, they're done um, with veterinary oversight, um, you've got animal health, animal ethics approvals, etc. So it's a very organised, very scientific and very structured trial. Uh, and everything was done in quadruplicate. So we had enormous, you know, it, you, it, there's enormous detail. Each one of these trials probably runs to four or 500 pages um, and costs in, in excess of um, say 60,000 Australian dollars, which in your terms is probably 40,000 uh, US dollars. So that just gives you a bit of a ballpark um, understanding. And we did something like 19 of these individual trials and then three safety studies where we used um, the, um, the fungus uh, uh, at five and 10 times dose. So these commercially around the world, these are the, the most important ones. So certainly Barber's pile worm is number one. 
along with Talidorsagia, Trichostrongylus, etc. Um, we get mixed infections, which means several worm uh, species infecting the host all at the same time. Uh, horse trials, similar sort of results. Again, um, if you look at the scale, you've got one to 4,000 on the left-hand side, side, which is an autumn trial. Um, on the right-hand side, you've got uh, between 2,000 and 10,000. Uh, they were, again, eight-week studies. Uh, so you, you've got this enormous uh, variation going on, and you can see some of them have very high levels. We had one trial that we did was snowed out. Um, uh, these are the sort of uh, small strong isles. Ascrids are a big problem around the world. Uh, very strong species. Again, you've got mixed species affecting um, the host all at the same time. Uh, in exotic animals, this work was done with uh, Disney at Disney Animal Kingdom uh, with, through, with Deidre Fontenot and uh, Dr. Um, uh, James Miller from Louisiana State. And we thank them most. Uh, and this was the data that we actually submitted to all three regulators that we're dealing with so far, which is Australia, New Zealand, USA. Um, you guys do things a little differently. We look at the amount, you're looking, this is the reverse of what we, the way we do it. But as you can see, we get massive reductions in giraffe, antelope, and gerina. Um, one of the questions we get often asked is, have you done work in such and such? Well, if you can feed it to the animal, it really doesn't matter because they're grazing animals, whether they're uh, monogastrics, whether they're camelids, three stomachs, or whether they're ruminants with four stomachs, it, the, the fungus passes through the animal into the manure and that's where it does its work. Um, zoo animals, uh, here's, here's, uh, Kevin took this photo of uh, me while we were at uh, Disney. This is a juvenile uh, female at Disney Animal Kingdom. Uh, the reductions from, this is a summary of all the trials. Um, and I would point out that it, uh, we get a, a much, greater reduction uh, um, on, on part of larva and pasture, which is significantly greater than any chemical worm, and I'll show you why in a minute. So we had, overall, we've had an 84% reduction in horses, 81% reduction in cattle, 86% reduction in goats, and 68% percent in sheep. Now, the question most people would ask is, why is sheep lower than the other three species? Well, I think it's the rigour of the trial, and I think it's also the amount of chemical resistance that exists uh, in sheep. So uh, they're the two main reasons why we see those differences. Um, there's widespread resistance and multi-resistance in production animals, and they are sheep, cattle, and goats. And that includes barber's pole worm, brown stomach worm, black stomach worm, intestinal worm, and thread neck worm. The extent of resistance uh, in production animals uh, was a survey by Matt Playford in 2014 where he found widespread resistance in common sheep parasites. So the BZs, there was 96% prevalence, 96% prevalence for levamisole, 87% ivermectin, 77% for abamectin, and 54% for moxidectin. So what this is showing is that these, these are not working particularly well. Now that doesn't mean that they can't work well or that you can't use them strategically, but there's a lot of resistance to these chemicals out there. Uh, again, the Australian Meat and Livestock Corporation, this was Lane et al. in 2015. They estimated that the losses in sheep production in Australia, and we've got uh, like 70 million sheep here, was around US $327 million. So the losses, um, you know, due to um, worm infection. For cattle, it was around US 70 million, and for goats, it was about 1.9. Now, those numbers are very low. And the reason that they're low is that there's not a lot of goat farming done in Australia. I mean, there's a lot of hobbyists and there are a lot of people that keep one or two, for example, but there's, goat farming is not something that's um, done uh, here. As far as horses were concerned, there was virtually no information at all. Um, now, all we know is that most people worm their horses from once a year to, um, eight times a year. So the average cost of a, of a wormer in Australia is about 
Australian dollars 15, which is probably around $10 US. So that gives you just a bit of a ballpark figure. Okay, so this is a did you know? It's been estimated, oh, just one second. Sorry. Uh, it's been estimated 10% of the population is within the host animal and about 90% on pasture. So I want you to have a really good think about this because when you worm your animals, you're only, the, the, the animal is only carrying about 10% of the total population. So what we're doing is we're worming animals, we're cleaning the animal out and then we're putting back onto contaminated pasture. Now, I don't know what you think, but I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense. So this is where bioworming comes in. And this is the, the missing piece of the puzzle, if you like. Because as, as we increase farming, we, we're trying to get uh, more utilisation of pasture, etc. It means it has more animal, which means that you have more manure on pasture. Um, the next uh, thing that I, I want you to have a think about is, is this one, which is if 10% of, uh, of the worms are within the animal, and the worm is 95%, then you're only reducing about 9.5%. So you're only going to have a 9.5% reduction by using a chemical wormer. If 90% of the worms are on pasture, and Duddington is only 70% effective, like the sheep does, uh, that means we're going to uh, knock off about seven times as many via the manure. Uh, I'll just skip over that. That's a fairly long video. Um, okay, these are the sort of things, and, and I'll just go through this very quickly that we've had to consider, and this is why it took us 20 years to do some of this work. So, you know, you've got things like spore production, dosage and delivery, production and formulation um, and manufacturing, shelf life studies, efficacy trials, safety studies, residue studies and exposure models, DNA fingerprinting and genome, and we've taken that a step further with the genome work that we've completed culture collection, lodgement, uh, toxicology studies in um, uh, lab animals, physical testing, environmental safety and intellectual property. And we've got ongoing submission to regulators. So that's why, you know, there's all these things and you have to do them to standards. So the FDA has certain standards. The European Feed Safety Authority has certain standards that you've got to do this trial work to. We met or exceeded um, or, you know, in, in, in all of those areas. We're still waiting on registration for Europe through the European Feed Safety Authority, um, and that will come, no doubt. Now, just to talk a little bit about the products. So we've got two products. We've got the concentrated product, which is Biowormer, and each gram of Biowormer contains 500,000 uh, chlamydia spores or spores per gram. The feeding rate is 0.1 of an ounce per 100 pound body weight. And it is really has been made to make that available to veterinarians, premix companies and feed mills. There's no meat or milk withholding period. Um, the two pack sizes we have in the US are 15 pounds and 30 pounds. Now this is, a, I guess, a, what we call a manufacturing product. So, and, and that's why it's, it's usually very difficult for, um, small um, landholders or people with a few animals to try and deliver 0.1 of an ounce per 100 pound is probably quite difficult. Um, this is why we have the liver mole with biowormer. It contains 30,000 spores per gram and it's delivered at 1.6 gram uh, ounce, sorry, 1.6 ounce per 100 pound body weight. And that's available through stores and end users. And we certainly could do with a lot more of those. I mean, Premier One has been uh, fantastic, but we would like to increase our distribution across uh, the US if we can. Again, there's no withholding periods for meat or milk. So we had a, a few questions where what happens if I drink my dairy goat milk? Uh, absolutely nothing will happen because it passes through the animal. The product is not absorbed by the animal. It passes through into the manure. Again, there's two pack sizes. That's a 15 pound and 30 pound. Um, I'm just, I'd like to just work through, this is on the label. 
And this might be a little bit monotonous, but I think it's important. So the first thing we need to do is treat an animal with a suitable oral injectable poron wormer. And then we use um, biowormer or live mole with biowormer after that. If possible, we need to try and move. So if you can bring animals into an area where uh, you worm them, and if you're bringing animals uh, in from a property outside, I really recommend that you, you quarantine worm them. So you bring them in and you might hold them in a, um, in a yard, for example, for 48 hours or longer. Now, if, you're, if you've got barber's pile worm, uh, it can survive for 50 or 60 days. So in some cases, in, in the sheep in particular, you would probably quarantine those animals for 50 or 60 days before you start to move them into the rest of your flock. Um, and I know that can be very difficult. Two, then move those treated animals onto low worm pasture, and that is pasture that hasn't been grazed by the same animal species for a minimum of six weeks and longer if possible. The most susceptible um, to worms are young animals from three months of age up to 18 or 24 months um, and uh, milking females. So that's the last month of pregnancy and while they're producing milk. Uh, animals except for goats, all animals except for goats, um, develop immunity. Goats never develop immunity. Your horses, your foals do, your calves do, your sheep do, uh, etc. but not goats. And that's one of the reasons why there's so many issues with, with goats when it comes to worming. Uh, and unfortunately, there's also very few products uh, registered for them. Um, and what happens in exactly the same as in humans, um, when, when the uh, female is lactating, um, they, their immunity drops and, and uh, they have less resistance to worm infection. Um, one point is important, do not underestimate pasture contamination by adult stock. So even very low fecal egg counts, um, considering the volume of species. I mean, if you look at the volume of manure uh, cattle drop on pasture, it is an enormous amount. And the same with, uh, with uh, sheep and horses and cattle and uh, goats. Thoroughly mix the bioworm into feed or feed supplements or concentrate and you commence daily administration to minimize. So if you're having trouble with palatability, one of the things I suggest you do is if we're talking about um, liver mole with bioworm, for example, instead of using 1.6 grams, I would bring it down to a quarter of that. Um, feed that out for the first two or three days, increase it to half a dose uh, for another two or three days and gradually bring them on. Now, it would be like um, if you hadn't been exposed to garlic. The first time you taste garlic, you might say, oh, I don't like that. But if you have smaller doses on a regular basis, you will develop, you, you'll, you'll start to accept the taste. There's certain things that are like, uh, all animals are no different to us. There's certain things that we like that are sweet or sour or hot, uh, et cetera. Um, and it's just a matter of giving the animal time. When we did the trials, we allowed an ad uh, adaptation period of at least 10 days. Um, and one of the reasons we used liver mole um, was the liver mole has a red colouring in it so we could see the animals had actually consumed it. And I think that was one of the other questions was um, request um, a practical strategy for ensuring anim each animal gets a therapeutic dose. Well, this is not a therapeutic product, so you don't need a therapeutic dose, but you do need a reasonable amount of spores to get through the animal into the manure for the for the um, for the for, for the fungus to do its job. So thoroughly mix. Um, I've covered that. Thoroughly use the um, bioworm in the feed. So mix it in. Top dress it. Whatever works for you. Some will readily ad adapt to the taste. Others will take longer. Again, just shandy it in to 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 get it. We don't. We haven't seen the issues in the US. But again, we sell a lot of liver mole and it's very well accepted in our market, but it's a new product in your market. So that might be the reason that it's taking a little longer. Again, just start off with a small amount first and work your way through. It will begin, one of the questions we're asked, how quickly will it begin or be, begin to work within the first day and maybe 
affect uh, continuously when warm, moist climatic conditions are conducive to parasite activity. So those uh, types of temperatures in the US, for example, for either bioworma or live mold bioworma, would be temperatures at or above uh, 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which is about five degrees Celsius. Um, we suggest you use bioworm or live mold with bioworm in conjunction with a worm management program. So again, contact your veterinarian or you've got some very good state um, people uh, here with us. Uh, uh, Quayne Matthews, Dahlia O'Brien, Susan Scotian or Nikki Whiteley, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to assist you and help you develop a strategic uh, integrated parasite um, plan. And it's also important to consider refugia. Now, refugia is one of those things that is um, difficult in some cases for people to get their heads around. I'll try and give you a very simple example. If we did uh, fecal egg count on say 10 animals and we would we would only look at um, worming um, say horses for example that had an egg count over 300 eggs per gram so if we did those 10 and we found that two had 500 eggs per gram and two had 50 eggs per gram and the others were uh, 50 to 100 eggs per gram or 200 eggs per gram we would only worm the two that have the high counts, the 500 eggs. We would not worry about worming the others. A lot of people look in shock and horror when we say these things. But until you've actually tried it um, and, and start to understand how it works, it does work very, very well. You're using a lot less wormer, um, a lot less chemical. Uh, and if you were to do that uh, every season, so in the... You're, you're in your spring at the moment, we're in, our, in what we call autumn, but you could, would call the fall. We would, at the beginning of each of those seasons, we encourage people to do faecal egg counts. The uptake on faecal egg counts is very low, but it's such an important thing and it's, such, it's a good barometer for what's going on in the pasture. Um, periodically, do these worm checks, monitor the effectiveness of your worm programs. Um, your options include doing faecal egg counts. You can also do faecal egg reduction tests and you can identify worm species using um, uh, faecal larval cultures. Um, retreatment with an effective chemical wormer should be, uh, when it's indicated, again, talk to your veterinarian or your, or your advisor. Um, we've got a website, which is biowormer.com. Um, I encourage you to go to that. Um, you can sign up for a newsletter or you can contact us and we can try and answer your questions. Um, I'll just go through some of the things that have been asked of me so far. And if there are any other questions, I'm more than happy to try and answer those things. Uh, I think I've covered the first one, uh, which was talked about the therapeutic dose. I wouldn't focus on the dose. I'd focus on getting the um, bioworm or live mold bioworm into the animal and into the manure. Um, you won't find it in milk in your dairy goats. Um, somebody said that they testified to the benefits of bioworma. Thank you very much, that's great. Um, how long do you need to use it with goats? First day is when you're going to start to get results. Um, smaller herds, um, we, look, the, the, we only have the two pack sizes. Um, maybe if you've got a, a goat group or a, um, you know, some, I, I belong to um, a horse association, uh, a stud group, um, and we share things that way. That might be a way of overcoming that. Um, no concerns at all. If you, One of the questions here is about um, uh, drinking da uh, dairy goat milk raw. That's no problem at all. And yes, it can be used in any age of animal um, and it can be fed uh, seasonally as long as you take into account things like moisture and temperature. Um, organic, we have organic accreditation in Australia. We have approached um, uh, a group in the US for organic accreditation and we're working through that at, at the present time. Um, how do you get it or order it? Well, you can, um, you can get it from Premier One. Um, uh, feed, uh, feed trough space, that's a good question. 
and it's a very important one. If you if animals have a lot of pasture around them, they're probably not going to be that interested in eating a supplement. You really need to train animals to, to eat any form of feed. So I would suggest in those cases, either um, you bring them in, and we find that a lot of uh, goat producers in particular, they bring them into a, into a yard and they feed them in a yard. The troughs need to be wide enough or maybe you need multiple troughs, it just it depends. Or you can use those like tyre feeders on the ground, they work well. Just try and make sure that you've got enough of them for, for the numbers. So if you've got, uh, say, 10, I'd probably have three or four of those tyre feeders or three or four troughs so that they've got space. We did find in the trials that there were those bully animals that would come into the, up to the feeders and they would, um, you know, obviously consume feed quickly. Um, we also found that there were animals that are shy and they wait for the others to go. So if you've got a number of feeders around the place, that gives everybody a bit of a chance to, um, to get it. With the lip mold bioworm, it has got a green colouring in it. Um, and so you should be able to identify the ones that, that are or aren't eating it. It's not absolutely essential. They all get the same dose every day. As long as they get a regular dosing of it, um, they should be fine. Um, the palatability issue, again, start off with a small amount, maybe a quarter of the dose, top dress it, blend it in. It's already got molasses in there. I know we've had a few questions about that. It's got molasses in there anyway, so you shouldn't need to add any more. Um, can be mixed with minerals, yes. Um, you can you can mix it um, in a in a mineral mix and feed it out to any, any species, really. Uh, how do you make sure that an animal is getting the correct amount? Again, space those feeders out, give them the opportunity, allow the ones that tend to sit back an opportunity to get in there and, and, and get the uh, feed. You'll find that most animals will work in in groups anyway. I think that's about it from me. Are there any questions? We had a lot of questions in the chat box. A lot of them you have already answered. A lot of them are, are um, a little off topic. And hopefully yep. we're going to go through some of them and make sure we covered them all. A couple of questions about different species of, of worms. Um, yep. is, is the fungus beneficial for one, lungworm, two, no. coccidia, and three, the meningeal worm, which is a uh, worm that affects white-tailed deer and sheep and goats and camel as are an abnormal host. I don't know if you had that one in Australia. No, we don't. Have, but we had that, had that question before, and the answer to those is all no. Um, we really need to focus on nematodes. So on the, on the labels, we've got a list of nematodes that are covered by the species, and that's what it covers. It doesn't do lungworm, it doesn't do tapeworm. Um, I'm just trying to think what else. Uh, coccidia. No, not coccidia. Coccidia is totally different. Okay. Uh, purely nematodes. Okay. There were a couple of questions about mixing um, bioworm or livermore with a medicated feed, specifically one that contained a coccidia stat. Are there yeah, any question. antagonistic um, effects. No, actually, that's a very, very interesting and topical question. Um, um, a number of you will probably be aware of a, uh, an ingredient called menensin sodium. Menensin sodium is sold in the US as rumensin. Um, it's it's uh, fatal for horses and dogs. But um, we actually did a trial uh, for th uh, three months using 250 milligrams, which is the dose that's required for cattle. Um, and menansin has an antifungal property. So you would think, you know, we're dealing with a fungus, it's going to give it a, a very hard time. Um, it, it had no effect on it for uh, about three months. And then the fungus did drop off. But um, just, I was having a look at the AFCO um, requirements and the um, feed, uh, cattle feed, uh, containing menensin and goat feed, I think, needs to be consumed within 30 days of manufacture. So even if it was 60 days uh, and you mix the two in together, there'd be no issue. We've ne we haven't found any issues with it used either with any vitamins or minerals or salts or anything else that you want to add. 
So it would be okay to mix with any feed regardless of the coccidia stat, whether it's monensin or lasalacin subject, or decox. Subject to the laws of the country that you're in. Okay, okay. Because okay. That's, the, that's the thing. So I, um, on the label at the moment, we've got four restrictions, use restrictions, not for use in medicated feed, not for use in free choice feed, do not feed undiluted, not for consumption, uh, indirect consumption. So not for medicated food, I would take that to mean a product con containing monensin. Now, you'll get into a technical debate. Monensin is a coccidious stat generally regarded around the world. So all the top feed companies would, you know, uh, food, McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken, all these sort of KFC, all these companies, will accept that those animals will be fed a coccidia stat because there is no other, um, then they're, they're not really classified as a medication from that point of view. A medication is something like oxytetracycline or chlortetracycline where it's a broad spectrum. So um, you, you, if you're going to, if you need to feed a product with a coccidia stat, and one of the things we are trying to do is we're putting an application into the EPA at the moment which removes those uh, use restrictions. We don't have them in Australia or New Zealand. Um, we don't have any issues with them. Um, we have uh, uh, farms in Australia that feed, um, what well, we've fed it to our own cattle. We fed um, monensin to our cattle and, and, and put the little mold bioworm in. And we do that during show preparation, for example. We've had no issues at all. But in saying that, I have to underline the fact that I'm operating legally within this country but if it says on the label that it is mandated that you can't do it, I mean, probably the way around it would be to feed the medicated feed and then you, you, you could feed the lip mold bioworm separately. Um, or you could probably top dress it because you're not, um, if, if you're doing it at home, but the, the, the stock feed manufacturer would not be able to, based on this label, would not be able to uh, necessarily uh, include bioworm in that in in a, uh, a feed containing um, an ensign. We think it's fundamentally wrong. It makes no sense, but it's your law, not our law. Is there any age limit as far as the animals that can be fed by a wormer? No, I think basically anything from pretty much weaned animals, anything from three months and 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 beyond. It won't hurt any animal anyway. It's natural in the environment. It comes from the environment. It goes back to the environment. Is it, do you think it's possible that the parasites will ever be able to develop resistance to bioworma? I think it's highly unlikely. I don't like using the word impossible. Um, nature has a way of making fools out of us. Um, but I don't think so, no. I mean, uh, chemicals, yes, they can they can adapt to th those circumstances. But when you put a fungus in there and that consumes them, I think the, the, that's a pretty good bet. Is it possible to overdose it? No. Um, if if an animal, I mean, we, we proved that with our um, uh, tox trial of studies. We did we fed it at five times dose and ten times dose. Um, that was five times in sheep and 10 times in, in cattle and in horses. Um, we had some very rotund animals at the end of it. Very fat. Question about a uh, closed herd. Is it reasonable to expect a certain duration of treatment to create a lasting solution? Or does it need to be used continuously with no endpoint? I, I don't know the answer to that because I don't think we've done enough work to, to be able to, um, but I, I, would, I would think, I mean, what we're, we're seeing at early stages of what we're seeing with goats, for example, is that we've got um, some farms that have now used it for 12 months and they're very, very happy with it. Um, they've reduced their chemical usage um, almost um, to zero. Um, I've got, um, a farm in New Zealand at the moment that's feeding it for the first two weeks of each month and it's run by a veterinarian and he's very very pleased with the results he said his results are excellent he's doing a lot less worming than he's ever done before 
what's the shelf life of both products and is there a temperature range and humidity range at which they should be stored? Um, shelf life is two years and, and store below 30. Will humidity affect storage if you're in a really hot, humid climate? Um, I, look, I, if you're in a really hot, humid area, I would, um, I would tend to put it into um, a cool room or into a room that, was, that, that stayed below uh, about 30 degrees. I don't know what 30 degrees is in your temperature off the top of my head. Somebody, somebody asked, how come bioworma can't be applied directly to pasture? Well, because it needs to go through the animal because it's got to go into the manure. We get this question asked. I've had farmers say, why can't I spray it on pasture? Um, you need to get it into the animal. What we're doing is using the animal as a delivery vehicle. And we need, if we get it into the manure, it's, remember um, David Attenborough, it's looking for that nitrogen source. It's very, it's a very, it's a predaceous um, fungus, so it's very focused on on the uh, on the parasite itself. So it's looking for a nematode, it's looking for a food source. The other thing that's important to note is if it runs out of food, it dies off in the manure. So it won't it won't establish on pasture. It won't even move on pasture. It has no effect, uh, and probably a good good question to, or comment to make now it has no effect on earthworms. Um, uh, dung beetles, any of the other things, it won't affect the environment. Um, and that that statement is certainly on the, I think it's on the US buckets as well. I think you've addressed this a little bit, but there's a couple of people on here that have alpacas and llamas and they want to know if the product is is equally effective in them. And also, is it a, when you consider that the, the behavior of camelids is to use kind of common poop areas, is it just as applicable to, to them? Yeah, look, I, I, it doesn't really matter whether they're a monogastric, a, um, um, a, an animal like a camelid with three stomachs or a ruminant with four stomachs. It, it applies as long as they're, gra they're grazing a pasture of some description. Uh, and even if you get browsers like giraffe, they eat leaves off trees and things, right? So, um, and then it passes through into the manure and that's where the fungus operates. It doesn't affect the animal anyway. It's purely, everything happens in the manure. One person mentions they have a horse that they keep in, the, in dirt or dry lot, but it still has measurable worm eggs. Will this product help if an animal isn't grazing? Um, yeah, we've had that, that issue before. You Sometimes you get animals that are very susceptible. So previously in uh, horse worming trials that we've done, I remember at one stage we had two groups of seven animals and we had what we call high shedders in each group. So high shedders are animals that um, maybe they'll have 2,000 eggs per gram and you'll worm them and you'll do a second fecal egg count about 14 days later and they're 1500. These are animals that are highly susceptible. Um, I think, I think, I, I think you'd have to look at the actual set of circumstances and find out why, but there are some, some animals that have fairly low immunity. Um, I'm sure you, if you, if you, if you fed it and you worm them appro appropriately and, and uh, kept your fecal egg counts up, I'm, I'm sure you'd make a difference but they're really the exception to the rule. A few people have asked about the studies a little bit. Uh, one question in particular, if the studies showed that sometimes the controls went down at times, what would be the reason for the larva on the control animals to go down? Well, the, the, all of the, first of all, the, the studies are all published. Um, in veterinary parasitology, so they're freely available. And if you can't get them, we're more than happy to share them. That's no problem. Um, you, you're always going to get variation in your control group. You're sure when I put those um, graphs up before, you some of them were very low to start off with. Some of them got very high. They 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 rise and then they suddenly drop. Um, and that that depends on on seasonality, uh, weather conditions, etc. Um, you'll get a lot more worms immediately after uh, rainfall. Uh, we saw that with um, the drought. Um, I warned a lot of people, uh, a lot of the farmers we knew that 
when we got eventually got the break, there would be a lot more worms than there were. Um, we've seen in years gone by where people haven't been um, as prudent as they needed to be. They've lost animals at that particular, because the animals are already weakened. Does that answer your question? I hope so. Um, I hope that, that satisfies the, the person that asked this question. Would it work with liquid manure sprayed onto a field? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can answer that. Um, I guess it, if there was still sufficient fungus in the manure, but I mean, one of the studies we did do, we, we, um, we took some liver mold with bioworm and we dampened it down and we found that the fungus dropped off reasonably quickly. So when I say reasonably quickly, if that manure, wet manure was used within say the 20, first 24 hours, in other words, it's been dropped on the ground, you've collected it and perhaps diluted it, 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 it it might continue to work, but it would depend on how much how much moisture was in that manure. A couple of questions have been asked about pelletizing it. Can it be put in a, in any kind of pellet? Yeah, we've tried that a few times, and we at this stage we haven't worked out a way of doing it. Uh, the fungus doesn't seem to like uh, heat, excessive heat. Um, it's it's happy at. 30 degrees in our temperatures Celsius, 30, 35 degrees Celsius, no problem. If we get long periods of say 40 degrees and above, which is very, you know, that's, you're talking over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 110, but ten, say 10 days, you find that you don't get much activity as far as the, um, the worms are on pasture and you don't get very much. And I think that's the issue. So I think it's a combination of, of pressure and heat. The fungus doesn't like that. It's an environmental creature, and it likes to have you know live within its um, its temperature range, which is about forty degrees Fahrenheit, and through to that one hundred and ten or maybe even one twenty. It's happy in that sort of, but it, it doesn't want you to squeeze it, and it doesn't want you to uh, give it excessive temperature for a long period of time. How do you respond to the people who say it's a great product and it looks like it really works, but boy, it's expensive and I don't think I can afford it. Well, I think if you use it um, strategically, you'll find that you can afford it. Um, resistance is getting worse all the time. We really have to do something different. Um, and I think uh, from a welfare standpoint, if you're going to say, oh, it's too expensive, my response probably to you uh, is, are you in the right business? Because I think there is a, there's, you know, as a, as a farmer, you, you need to consider, and I, I don't think it will be too expensive if you use it the right way and you put the, the, the fecal egg counts and the other strategies in place, I think you find that it will be quite economical to use and you'll get benefits over time. Can people find links to the studies on your website? Yes, yes, all the studies are there. Uh, if they're not, um, go to bioworma.com and send me an email and I'm more than happy to send you the attachments, but they're there, they're there if you can't find them. Okay, well, thank you very much, Chris. We're gonna do a short poll and after we do that poll, we'll have one last call for questions. But I appreciate if you would take the time to answer our poll. And then we'll, we'll kind of look at the chat box and I'll ask my colleagues to see if there's any questions that I might have missed. We had questions coming pretty fast and furious um, and it's hard to sometimes to know if we covered all of them. Some of them were very similar and interrelated. So my colleagues, you are certainly free to speak if you can identify a question that Chris may not have been asked or, or covered in his presentation. This is one of the best things to me that, that's come out to, to be beneficial to sheep and goat producers or livestock producers in a long time. It's pretty exciting. It's pretty clear that it works and it's um, as part of a, your overall program. One question was how many doses in a 15 pound pail? <laughs> Good question. Um, are we, uh, 
Uh, I'm going to calculate. I'll work it out for you. Basic math. It depends on the size of your animal and how long you feed it or. We've had a couple of questions about lungworm. Um, yep. Since lungworm is a roundworm, um, is it not been tested or just not effective? No, well, we, have, we, we didn't come across lungworms um, in, in any literature with, as, as with regard as a nematode. But, and, the, and, and what we did look at and, what, and the work that we've done around it was, was um, yeah, it was all based on, on, on nematodes. So um, th that's, that's one I'll have to take on notice and I'll, and I'll, I'll um, see what we can find out for you. One of the questions was about the meningeal worm, which you don't have in Australia. One of the reasons it's not gonna be effective is because sheep, goats, and camelids are dead end hosts. There's, there's no oh, eggs and larvae that they, um, in their manure. So I appreciate everybody taking the time to, to fill out the poll. It helps us. Again, somebody is asking from Camelid to use the same spot for defecation. I used it for about a month and was advised not to remove the manure from the dry lot. Saw an increase in strong jowls. What was I doing wrong? Um, sorry, can you run that question by me again? Yeah, it shot up the screen. I don't know what, I don't know if Chris answered the question about whether it is useful on camels, which you did, and it is, who tend yeah. to use the same spot for defecation. I used it for about a month and was advised not to remove manure from the dry lot, saw an increase in strong jowls. Okay, what? so what was what was the advice based on? Did, was there any any sort of yeah, test have, done? Yeah, or I, was I it just? A, I, I mean, know, just, one of these one of the issues is people make these make comments like this, but there's no. You really need to know the background before you, you can try and answer that question. So that makes it a a, a bit hard to um, to do that. Now, I'll just. To, I'm just trying to work out the 15 pounds in the... Um... I think a whole bunch of people are doing the math. It's okay. just, again, it's just basic math based mm -hmm. on the size of your animal, the dosage, mm -hmm. and the number of days that you're feeding it. Mm -hmm. And I'll put it in the chat box. Okay. Oh, somebody else did too. <laughs> I did the, the uh, bioworm itself too, so not just the lava mold. Chris, is there research, a lot of research underway in this country that you're aware of with bioworma? Well, we haven't had, we haven't had to do the research because the regulators accepted the work that we've done in Australia. And, and one of the things about doing it to these good clinical practice is it probably doesn't matter where you do the work. Now, if you look at Australia and the US and the issues of, of resistance, um, this is probably the mecca of the world when it comes to worms. So, um, you know, we could, we can do more work. And if you guys want to do some work with us and we're more than happy to do that, that's all, that's always been the case. I mean, all the work of, uh, at, um, in the exotic animals was all done at Disney anyway. And with, uh, James Miller and, uh, and Deidre Fontenot and, and, and some of the students that James had. So, um, I mean, yeah, we can certainly do more. There's a couple of questions about the effectiveness on whipworm. Yep. Whipworm's a roundworm, so effective, right? It should be effective. It's not something that we come across a lot. So um, I'd be a little guarded in my response because it's not one that we regularly see, but it should, it should, be, it should be fine. Somebody's asking about a bulk purchase price. I know myself from looking at the Premier website, um, there is a bulk purchase price, yes. That does not yep. include shipping, so you have to weigh the, the differences. Yep. I only feed grain for a month before and after lambing. The rest of the grazing season, the flock is rotated approximately every two days. Would Biowarma be effective in this management scheme? Um, I think it certainly would be worth 
trying. I mean, that gives you two months out of the year. And if it's in springtime where you've got rapidly growing pasture, um, keeping in mind that your, your females will have lower immunity, um, I think that would give them a good chance. It'd be, it would be probably better if it was slightly longer. If you could go to, um, say, a month before lambing, for example, and then, say, maybe two months afterwards, or even through to the weaning period. But I think something is always better than nothing. The label says to treat all. What about treating only those with, or not treating, but feeding only those with poor FAMACHA scores? Yeah, that's another way you could do it. Um, it, it I guess it depends if they're, um, if they're grazing with other animals. If they're grazing with that other animals um, and, and potentially picking up uh, parasites, um, you might need to consider that. Are there any plans to come up with a product in smaller quantities for people who maybe ha only have a couple of animals, a couple of small animals, like a couple of dairy well, goats? The, okay, so the, the way we've done it in Australia is we've had someone like Sandra Baxendale, who's, who's goat vet Oz, and she's a specialist in goats. So we would send her our 15 kilo pails, your 30 pound, and she um, packs it off. She, so she, she gets the um, farmers to send in the fecal egg counts. She suggests the wormer. They go off and buy their own wormer. And she supplies them with a kilo of biowormer and they feed it out and then they come back when they've, um, when they've uh, fed it out. So I think that's, the way, that's probably the way to, to, to do that. Or well, again, if you've got a, um, a, a goat group, you could buy as a group and, sh and share the product within the group. So I'm looking to see if there's any unanswered questions. I think you've done a really good job answering a lot of the questions that, that people have both in your presentation and in the questions in the chat box. I'm going to make a last call for questions. I'm running up through the scrolling up through the questions to see if we've missed any and I don't really see any. One question that someone asked was, um, how long does it, uh, does it live on the pasture? How long does the fungus live on the pasture? Well, it, okay, so the, the answer to that is it doesn't actually live on the pasture. It will live within the manure for as long as there are active parasites within the manure. And it, 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 you won't, basically you won't get any on pasture. It does, there's virtually no vertical, vertical or horizontal integration. So it's not going to climb up the stem of a, a plant and remain there. The, the um, uh, indigenous, um, for want of a better word, um, the, the naturally occurring um, fungus that are on that pasture are still there. But what we're feeding in, in the ter in terms of bioworm or liver mold with bioworm will only will end up in the manure and that's basically where they'll remain. We had a couple of questions asking about how to incorporate it into a free choice mineral. Okay, so well, we do a lot of blending of those sorts of things. So what we would do is, uh, first of all, we'd want to know how much you're feeding, you allow to feed out each day. So let's say, I don't know, let's say you're, you're feeding um, 100 grams, for example, which would be um, about four ounces we would put sufficient, depending on the weight of the animal. So if you said to me, my average weight is 100 pounds, um, you'd need, um, as far as bioworm would be concerned, you'd need 0.1 of a gram. We would put 0.1 of a gram in four ounces. So you had an, an average, um, and, and assuming that each animal was consuming about four ounces a day or whatever number it is consuming a day. So it, it's, it's, a matter, it's, it's a matter of simple maths. How long can you um, leave it in a free choice mineral feeder? Um, I, I mean, as long as it doesn't get rained upon, um, a week would be no problem. As long as it's in the pail that they buy it in, 
how long does it last? 30 to 60? Two, well, two days. years from the date of manufacture. Years. Another question back on the camel lids. Yep. So should they not clean up their communal dung piles? I would. I definitely, I definitely clean it up. Um, uh, uh, remove, remove it um, and dispose of it. Unless you're, unless you're composting and you're very good at composting. Nikki, Kwame, Delia, do you see any more questions? Or shall we call it a night or a morning in the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have to go to work now. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, again, we, we very much appreciate you doing the webinar for us this evening. Um, mm -hmm. You learn a lot more when you, when you learn from the people who develop the product. Mm -hmm. And um, we really appreciate it and uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day while we shall, most of us, retire for the evening. Of course, I guess it depends on what part of the U.S. you're in because in some places it's still earlier. So again, thank you and thanks to my colleagues. And for those, um, again, this will be uh, posted to YouTube. Uh, just give us several days to work on that recording and get that up. Thanks for uh, filling out the poll. Can I just say thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure presenting um, tonight your time and this morning our time. Um, and just um, please stay safe and healthy. Yes.